Thank you, everyone. Uh, this is the Science Party budget reply for 2020-2021. A lot of 20s. This budget reply comes from the fundamental position that the role of government is to provide the conditions for people to flourish. I will critique parts of the budget presented to us by the, by the Australian federal government and then present a better alternative. Just to orient ourselves, the dollar amount of the Australian government's federal budget is about $50 billion. So just keep that in mind when we're talking about $1 billion here and $10 billion there. $500 billion is the total. It's a little higher this year because uh, the government's spending big, which we'll get to. The budget that we got in 2020 is pretty unique, and that's fair enough because we're in a unique situation. A new virus has forced us to change the way we live to protect life. And if you think we need to be more concerned about the economy, good news for you. The best thing we can do to protect life is to, uh, the best thing we can do for the economy is to protect life on a large scale because doubling the death rate is very bad for the economy. Some businesses have been restricted by law for the sake of infection control and a government that exercises that kind of power must compensate people financially uh, to prevent them from fall falling into poverty. Um, our federal government boasts that it is that its initial response to the pandemic in, included $2,299 billion in support. That's a lot of money. Um, and it's strange for our Liberal National Coalition government to be boasting about this because they have spent a lot of time criticising government stimulus spending and have tried for seven years to build credibility by claiming it would get the federal budget back into surplus. And it is still taking jabs even today at Labor on social media for its stimulus spending. Uh, but in the face of economic disaster caused by the pandemic, completely out of the government's control, um, our government turned Keynesian. That is, it embraced government spending to stimulate the economy. This is the immediate solution for the problem we have right now. People have no money. There aren't enough jobs. Giving people money solves that problem and the consequence is public debt, but we can address that once food is on the table. Pandemic spending to support individuals is set to continue in the coming year or two. Job Seeker, previously known as New Start, was doubled from $275 to $550 per week, thanks to the coronavirus supplement. It was a quick change from the best form of welfare is a job to the best form of welfare is twice what we'd been paying you until now. The base rate of Job Seeker, formerly known as New Start, is shown on the slide there in light blue, and the supplement is shown in dark blue. Uh, still doesn't get you up to the full time minimum wage, um, but it it does have to be asked that if two hundred and seventy five dollars was not enough at the start of the year, why is it going to be enough in January when the coronavirus supplement runs out? Uh, job seeker had to be doubled because middle class Australia can't live on it because their rent or mortgage payments are too high. And this is the result of two uh, intersecting policies. Uh, one, decades of punitive and stingy welfare. And that's combined with a commitment to policies that push up house prices for the last two decades. There is plenty of support for businesses in the budget. Uh, and these businesses will supposedly keep people employed. We have JobKeeper, the wage subsidy available to employers at a flat rate of $750 per week if they've lost a substantial amount of their income to the pandemic. But uh, one size doesn't fit all, given that work is not always regular. If you're a casual worker who has been employed for less than a year, you're not eligible for JobKeeper. And that includes many workers in the arts and hospitality sectors, nor international visitors who were invited to Australia to work or study and had been working here and had been paying taxes here. They're also excluded. Also for businesses, a $4 billion subsidy, not that much in the scheme of things, but um, a $4, $4 billion subsidy to employers who employ young adults who have recently received welfare payments, the job maker hiring credit, uh, $100 per week for people in uh, the age range 30 to 35, 200 from um, who are under for people who are under um, 30 years of age if they have been on a welfare payment recently 
Um, but does that create new jobs? Businesses tend to hire people when there is unmet demand. They don't just hire people because it would cost less than usual to do so. There is little evidence that wage subsidies work as intended, and if they do, why does it not extend to workers over the age of 35? Youth unemployment can have long-lasting effects, for sure, but anyone who has lost their job to the pandemic was in an industry that needs assistance. One of the biggest budget items is the extension of the instant asset write-off, which lets all but the biggest businesses claim a tax deduction for purchases up to $150,000. So this is not your $6,000 toaster. In fact, this is 25 $6,000 toasters. It's set to cost $27 billion over four years, and I suppose we can only hope that it's used by enterprising businesses who just needed a little bit of a leg up. Um, a business initiative actually that seems better, target, better targeted is the loss carryback scheme. This lets businesses claim back tax uh, that they've paid over the last two years against their current losses. So usually businesses would have to make a loss first and then uh, reduce their tax when they return to profit. And this goes the other way around. It seems fairly solid and gives a boost to businesses that are usually profitable in the before coronavirus times. So there's a lot in there for businesses. Um, now on to education and training. The budget announced some funding uh, for these sectors. Um, it must be said that universities got themselves into a precarious position by accepting so much income from international student fees, which has collapsed. But universities are ineligible for JobKeeper thanks to uh, a few tweaks that were made to the rules that seemed targeted at um, excluding universities. So universities are shedding hundreds of jobs, uh, but four private universities were given an exemption. So the private universities can access JobKeeper. Uh, funding for training includes $1.5 billion in wage subsidies on top of the previous program, uh, $1.5 billion for apprenticeships specifically, as well as a $1 billion job trainer program. Uh, I promise that's the last noun verba program I'm going to speak about tonight, job trainer, $1 billion for vocational education. But that is nothing new. The government is patting itself on the back for inventing TAFE, which has been gutted for a generation. Now, looking at the personal tax side of the budget, what is in it for me? Uh, there are $18 billion worth of personal income tax cuts being brought forward. They were scheduled for uh, the next five years, but they have been brought forward um, early and they are largely a tax break for being moderately rich. 90% 90, 90 of the benefit will go to Australians in the top 20% of incomes, but it must be said that 100% of the benefit will go to people who are paying income tax. Uh, so that means you have an income. Specifically, people on a salary of $120,000 stand to benefit the most. Uh, yes, there are people richer than that, and they haven't had as much of a tax break, but they will over the next four or five years as uh, more of those tax breaks uh, do come in in the time that they were originally scheduled. So uh, unlike all the other initiatives that I've mentioned so far, this is an ongoing change and not a one-off spend. This is our government baking in less revenue for the future, despite insisting that a budget, budget surplus is so important. Are Australians who get a tax cut going to spend their extra cash to stimulate the economy? It uh, might not actually be very likely. We're saving much more than usual. There are no overseas holidays and people are paying down their mortgages. Now, I just want to touch briefly on aged care because of the situation that we're in. It's pretty rich for the federal government to announce $1.6 billion in aged care funding as though it is a proactive measure. It is a small patch on a system that has been gutted since the Howard years. Uh, of Australia's 900 COVID-19 deaths to date, over 670 of them have been in federally subsidised aged care homes. The standards of care are shockingly low thanks to deregulation and aged care needs funding, higher staffing ratios and higher training requirements. 
On to what was announced for infrastructure and manufacturing. We are, of course, glad to see a commitment to building a national broadband network, but always remember that the coalition was dragged, kicking and screaming to this minimum standard. COVID-19 has shown us the importance of a fast, reliable internet connection for everyone, for work, education, healthcare and social connections for mental health. 1.5 billion announced for manufacturing is a welcome start, but a drop in the ocean. Apparently we are getting $14 billion in accelerated infrastructure projects, and we can't fault that unless it includes gas pipelines. Uh, that brings us to the flatulent elephant in the room, which is the supposed gas-led recovery as pushed by the National COVID Coordination Commission which was stacked with people connected to fossil fuel companies. I was pretty shocked and disappointed to see Australia's chief scientist talk about gas as a backup to renewables with no real ambition to push for rapid decarbonisation. Gas will not fuel our future. Gas is fueling the present and it is one of the forms of energy that we need to move away from. Australia's economic activity right now is intrinsically linked to producing carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. We have to electrify everything and decarbonise electricity and uh, other parts of industry as well. Um, this, this budget was a huge lost opportunity to invest in clean energy. However, for all of the ideological disagreements that I have with the federal budget, perhaps the worst aspect of it is that it relies on faith to the point of being negligent. It assumes that the economy will bounce straight back and grow by 5% in 2021, 2022. So this is something our government has been doing for years. It projects surpluses thanks to strong tax revenue, which never eventuate because the economy was flopping towards a recession. The current budget assumes that businesses will keep staff on after the subsidies run out, and that the states open their borders to each other, both of which are probably dependent on a vaccine for COVID-19 becoming available by the end of next year. It might, it might not. This shying away from reality is as destructive, I think, as the spending choices that the government makes. The budget also does not reflect the $35 billion withdrawn by individuals from their superannuation. That's an extra 15% on the $228 billion officially spent on welfare. So these are people in financial distress, withdrawing from their retirement savings, completely negating the point of compulsory superannuation and setting up future budgets for a blowout in the age pension. And we know that that doesn't affect Australians equally. We know that women and new Australians who have recently migrated here are less likely to have a comfortable superannuation balance to retire on. So, while I believe it is important to critique the budget we had, this brings us to the part that I much prefer, which is to explain what the Science Party would do. We're sticking with the principles that have served us well to date, funding essential services and new discovery, with the aim of improving the well-being of all who live in this country. The Science Party has not prepared a budget package per se, we believe in our policies at all times of the year, and I'll share some of these now. We can look at the things that we need during a pandemic, fast and reliable internet, manufacturing capacity, strong education and healthcare systems, and affordable childcare, and safely assume that those things would be valuable outside of a pandemic and invest in them. Further, every budget from now on, every government initiative from now on, must prioritise decarbonisation as far as it's relevant from now until it is done. So a few things that we need to focus on are to electrify everything and decarbonise electricity. The Science Party holds a target of 800% renewable energy, 100% being the amount we use. The rest can be exported directly via undersea cable as hydrogen or indirectly by producing energy intensive products like green steel, rather than just exporting unprocessed iron ore. The states and territories are working with private industry to get these projects underway and uh, there is um, uh, there are some state and federal um, investments going on and we would look to expand those. 
We also promote research into new forms of nuclear energy and a price on carbon pollution and other greenhouse gas emissions. Australia has had the Clean Energy Target, the Renewable Energy Target, the National Energy Guarantee. If we want to create jobs, we need to provide a stable regulatory environment for businesses. A price on pollution is something that businesses can work with and it does the right thing by the natural world and the people who live in it. Further on industry and infrastructure, um, it's not even an election year right now and still the Science Party supports building high speed rail. We have also a policy of subsidising 95% of the cost of childcare up to a national benchmark and also to remove means testing because the aim as we see it, is to allow parents to work when they see fit. Uh, JobKeeper should be extended to uh, universities, obviously. Uh, there is a wealth of experience bound up in em university employees and to lose them, especially if they go overseas, um, is knowledge that would take decades to rebuild. Uh, also, casual workers and um, non-citizens, um, uh, migrant workers, uh, there is no reason why they should be denied the same um, access to JobKeeper given that <laughs> they work in the same economy. Um, and on the direct response to the pandemic, uh, one line item from the federal budget that the Science Party supports is the nearly $2 billion spent on working towards a COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, we would commit more given the entire business recovery mentioned so far assumes that a working vaccine will be rolled out uh, late next year. We have a long-standing policy of doubling public research spending uh, and develop public spending on research and development uh, from roughly $10 billion a year to $20 billion. And how are we going to pay for it? Turns out discovery pays for itself uh, with every dollar invested in the right types of research returning about $3 to the economy. Uh, again, on the direct response to the pandemic, the pandemic has made a case for an Australian Centre for Disease Control, or ACDC, if you will. This is one of the Science Party's newest policies to establish a, an Australian Centre for Disease Control. Uh, it would coordinate the response to health crises and perform surveillance, manage preparedness and coordinate health messaging. The COVID-19 response has unfortunately fallen into a mishmash of government committees with no real resourcing, uh, partly to research institutes, parts of the public service that still have to do their regular work, private contractors and professional societies. We are going to see more pandemics in this century and a standing independent national organisation is best placed to oversee this response. Uh, on tax, um, I see no need for the new personal income tax cuts. Our taxation system certainly should be simplified, but Australians in the top 20% income bracket do not need a tax break while anyone is living in poverty in this country. We must raise the rate of job seeker to give everyone that fabled fair go that we've heard so much about. We have to correct obvious distortions in the housing market, chief among them the capital gains tax discount, which incentivizes investment in property, which only increases in price because we all agree. Uh, thanks to the capital gains tax discount, income from buying and selling houses is taxed at a lower, lower rate than income from work. Other inflationary policies include the first home buyers grants. Uh, the Science Party is committed to removing the capital gains tax discount and working with states and territories to replace stamp duty with a land value tax. And now some odds and ends. If there was ever a time for finding efficiencies, it's now. If there was ever a time for ending the school chaplaincy program, it was as soon as it was implemented. But the second best time is now. The federal court in 2014 um, ruled that it was unconstitutional for the federal government to fund religious chaplains in public schools, but the government continues to do so via a loophole to the tune of $61 million next year. Now that's a small amount in the scheme of the budget, but completely unjustifiable and counter to the principle of secular government. Science Party policy is to replace the chaplaincy program with trained professional counsellors for the benefit of all students in public schools. Something that is not that to be trimmed is the Australian National Audit Office, an independent agency under the direction of the Auditor General, and on a budget of $112 million, it exposed some serious problems with government spending over the last year, including uh, over the last few years, including 
100 million dollars in sports rorts, 19 million dollars spent on the Inju cashless debit card trial rort, the 30 million dollar Leppington Triangle rort to do with the Western Sydney Airport, and the year before that the 443 million dollar Great Barrier Reef Foundation rort. Uh, the budget of the audit office is being cut by 10%. A science party government wouldn't do that, but then again, we would not do the rorts. This office is one of uh, the few things we have to keep federal government spending accountable at the moment. However, we need a federal ICAC to keep parliament and the public service accountable. So, um, budget night uh, is seen as the economist's Christmas. It's a, a big for some reason, it's a big day in the uh, Australian political calendar, but it should not be the one night of the year that we get a coherent statement and a bit of an insight into what our government is choosing to fund. Uh, year round, during a crisis or otherwise, people deserve an honest government that works for them. Thank you.